Hi, I'm Dave from GMAT Ninja, and this video is going to be about multi-source reasoning. This is part of our new series of videos about the new data insights section, um, the GMAT Focus Edition. So if you've watched our earlier videos and you feel like you've got a good handle on the fundamentals, this is a good video for you. Or if you've tried some multi-source reasoning questions and you're getting flustered, you're feeling overwhelmed at the amount of data that you have to sort through, this video will also be useful for you. So first, quick review of structure. The data insights section is 20 questions and 45 minutes long. So that's gonna break down to about two minutes and 15 seconds per question. Within those 20 questions, you will see one or two sets of multi-source reasoning questions. Within each set, you will see three questions. So of the 20 questions on the data insights, you'll see three or six multi-source reasoning questions. Uh, and as the name implies, with each set, you're going to get multiple sources of information. And those sources can be pretty much anything. It could be a reading comp type passage, it could be a table or a graph, and it could be some kind of miscellaneous graphic that you have never seen before in your life. And I tried to produce one of those or find one of those for the second set of questions that we're going to talk about. And so you really need to be prepared for anything. Now, the big reminders are one, when that information pops up on the screen, don't rush, right? A lot of times our instinctive response when we see a lot of information is just to process it as quickly as we can and get right to the questions. But the same way that when you see a reading comp passage, you don't rush to the questions. You take your time and you read the passage and you get a sense of the structure. You're gonna do the same thing on multi-source reasoning. So you wanna click on each tab. These sources are gonna come up one at a time. And you just want to get a lay of the land. If there's a graph, pay attention to how the axes are labeled. If there's a table, pay attention to well, what does that table contain? If there's a passage, read the passage, get a sense of what kind of information is contained within the passage. So you want to look at everything, you want to know where everything is, but you also don't want to obsess because those sources aren't going anywhere. You can always go back to them. And then last, you want to stay organized and flexible because the questions on multi-source reasoning can ask pretty much anything. They could be reading comp type questions where you're finding information in a passage. They could be conventional quant questions where you're solving some algebraic equation, or they can be some kind of weird, open-ended, bizarre question where you kind of have to do trial and error to see what might happen in various scenarios. So stay organized, stay flexible, don't rush, get a lay of the land first. All right, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna bring up the first set of questions and we're gonna start with the sources on screen without the question. Now, no, because it obviously isn't viable for you to be clicking on tabs watching this at home, we had to have all of the sources on screen at the same time. So just know that when you're doing this on your own, that's not how the information is gonna be presented. It will show up one tab at a time and you'll have to click on the tab that contains the source you wanna look at. Okay, so if you guys are ready, we're gonna put a little time on the clock. And again, the sources are gonna show up first. We want you to take a look at those before considering a question. Then we're gonna layer in a question uh, and then we'll have a little chat about it. Okay, so I'll see you guys in a little bit.
All right, so let's talk about that first question. So again, before you do the question, you want to take a look at your sources. And so one source was height for age standards. So that was giving you your height percentile in terms of age. And then the other one was called your weight for height standards. So that one is giving you your weight percentiles in terms of height. And so you just want to read the text, get an idea of what they're telling you about that table or graph. Understand that if you're asked about, say, the weight percentile in terms of height, okay, then you want your line graph. And if they ask you about the height percentile in terms of age, you want your table. And so that's getting a lay of the land. So then we'll look at that first question. And so this is one where they say, we're gonna click yes or no, depending on whether the statement is true of a boy selected at random from this model population, these kids between the ages of two and five. All right, so we're gonna look at these statements one by one, try to determine if each one is true. Now, in these kinds of questions, you have to get all three statements right to get the question right, right? This is just one question and you gotta get them all right. So we look at that first statement, which says, okay, if his age is greater than three years, three months, the probability that his height is at least 98 centimeters is greater than 50%. So the first thing I wanna do here is to kind of simplify in terms of what I'm looking for. So it's like, okay, we seem to be talking about height in terms of age. So we're looking at that table first. And I want to ask myself, well, what happens if I'm looking at exactly three years and three months and exactly the 50th percentile? So I find three years and three months on the left and I slide over to the right until I find the 50th percentile. And lo and behold, it's 98 centimeters. So what that means is if I have a room full of kids who are three years and three months old in that room, half of the kids are gonna be 98 centimeters or less, and half of the kids are gonna be taller than that. So in that room full of the kids who are three years and three months, the probability is exactly 50% that the kids would be 98 centimeters or taller. But look at that statement again. We're talking about an age greater than three years and three months. Okay, so now picture another room where everyone is older than three years and three months. In this room, it's gonna to have to be the case that more than half are 98 centimeters or taller, right? Because the kids are getting taller as they get older and you can see that in the table. So that first statement is going to be a yes because more than half of that population of kids older than three years and three months will be 98 centimeters or taller. The probability is over 50%. So don't get rattled by the term probability. We don't have to do any math. So the first statement's a yes. We move on to the second statement. If he is at least 105 centimeters tall, the probability that his weight is 14 kilograms is no greater than 3%. All right. Again, a kind of confusingly worded statement, but we seem to be talking about weight in terms of height. So we wanna look at that bar graph that gives us our weight percentiles. And again, we'll start with a simple scenario. We'll just ask ourselves, okay, what if we're talking about someone who is exactly 105 centimeters, maybe exactly 14 kilograms? So on the x-axis where you have your heights, you move until you find 105, then go up until you'll be at the equivalent of 14 kilograms on the y-axis. And notice that at that point, you're touching that black line, which is the third percentile. And so what that means is that if you have a room full of kids who are all exactly 105 centimeters tall, 3% of those kids will weigh 14 kilograms or less. But the statement is about kids who are at least 105 centimeters tall. And you can see as you move to the right, the kids get taller, you're always below that line. And so within this room, we know that less than 3% of the kids are going to be 14 kilograms or less. And so the answer to this question is going to be another yes. Yes, the probability is no greater than 3%. We're always below that line. 
And again, this is one you want to reread because it's very easy to get tripped up on that confusing language. Yes, it is no greater than 3%. So we have another yes. Now the last statement says, if he is 114 centimeters tall, he's taller than at least 85% of the boys his age. Now notice here, it doesn't specify how old he is. So what I want to do is I want to look at an extreme scenario. I want to imagine he's five years old, right? Because if he's taller than 85% of the kids his age at five, well, he has to be taller than 85% of the kids who are younger because those younger kids are shorter. So again, we're talking about height in terms of age. We're going back to the table. On the left side, I'm going to find five years, zero months. And I'm going to slide over until I find the 85th percentile. And that's 114.8. So I'm going to make a very quick visual here. And I just sort of imagine, okay, 114.8, that's going to be taller than 85% of that population. And it'll be shorter than 15%. But in this statement, we're talking about someone who is 114 centimeters. So obviously right here, they're not gonna be taller than 85% of the kids his age. So this one is going to be a no. So of those first three statements, we get yes, yes, no. We gotta get all three right in order to get the question right. And notice that we didn't have to do any math here. We just had to read carefully, potentially reread some of the confusing language and then find the relevant bits of information in the relevant source, either the table or the bar graph. Not so bad. Okay, let's do another one. I'm gonna put a few minutes on the clock uh, and then we'll talk about another question. See you guys in a bit. All right, let's talk about question two. So now this one, we're talking about a specific scenario where if we've got a boy who's four years, three months old, who is 110 centimeters tall and his weight is 19 kilograms, we're trying to determine if the following three statements are true or not. So I'm just gonna write those on the board so I don't forget. So he's four years, three months, He's 110 centimeters tall and he's 19 kilograms. So now I'll go to the statements and determine if each one is true or not. So the first one says approximately 50% of the boys at the same weight are shorter than B. So this is kind of interesting, right? So this is saying, okay, given a certain weight, half are shorter. So we're talking about height percentile in terms of weight, but notice we never get that. In the table, we've got height percentile in terms of age. In the table, we've got weight percentile in terms of height, but we never have height percentile in terms of weight. So that first statement is a quick no. We just don't have that information. 
And this goes back to getting the lay of the land and reading very carefully, right? Because it's very easy to get tripped up between whether you have the weight percentile or the height percentile. So then we look at that second statement, which says no more than 15% of boys at this age are taller than me. So let's think about that for a second. If exactly 15% of the boys were taller, then 85% would be shorter. And so what we want to do is let's find the 85th percentile height for boys his age or four years, three months. So on the left side, this is again the table that has height percentile in terms of age. On the left side, we'll find four years, three months. We'll slide over to the right until we see the 85th percentile. And what we see is that the 85th percentile at that age is 109.5 centimeters. So again, I'll make my very simple diagram. At 109.5, you'd be taller than 85% of the population and shorter than 15%. And so this boy who's 110 centimeters is going to be right here. And so it is going to be true that no more than 15% of the boys are taller, right? It's going to be less than 15%. So now again, got to read that very closely. And the answer is yes, no more than 15% are taller. So the second statement is a yes. And now in the third statement, we see these height is greater than or equal to that of 50% of boys aged five years, zero months. Okay, so here, again, we're going back to the height percentile in terms of age. And now we want to figure out, well, what is the 50th percentile for boys who are five years and zero months? So we find five all the way at the bottom of that table, slide over to the 50th percentile, and lo and behold, it is exactly 110 centimeters, meaning in a room full of five-year-olds, exactly half of them are 110 centimeters or less. And so then we know that, okay, yeah, if this theoretical boy is 110 centimeters tall, he's taller than exactly 50% of the five-year-olds. And so that's going to qualify as 50% or greater. And so that last one, is a yes. So for this set of statements, we get no, yes, yes. All right, let's do one more, uh, and then we'll look at another set of questions after that, that is gonna be a little more unconventional to say the least. So I'll see you guys in a couple of minutes to discuss the last question with this set. All right, let's talk about this last question, question three for this first set. So this one is asking us to consider a boy from a model population. And it's saying that between the ages of two and five, the weight was always at the 50th percentile of the height and the height was always at the 50th percentile of the age. So he's 50th percentile in both the table and the graph. And we need to figure out what's true of the boy at five. And so notice this is one of those questions that feels pretty open-ended. You don't necessarily know what to look for. Like you could dive in and start looking at, okay, well, what is the 50th percentile height at various ages? What's the 50th percentile weight at various heights? But because there's so much information and we don't necessarily know what to look for, this is one where it probably makes sense to look at the answer choices first. And so this one, we just have to pick one that's correct. So we look at answer choice A, which says his age is the 50th percentile for his height. Well, this is a quick elimination, right? Because we never have age percentile. We have height percentile in terms of age, but never the age percentile. So because we don't have that, 
A is out from the start. And we look at B, which says his weight is 50th percentile for his age. Well, again, we don't have that. We have the weight percentile for the height. We have the height percentile for the age, but we never have the weight percentile for the age. B is another quick elimination. It's a theme here. Look at C. C says his height is the 50th percentile for his weight. But we don't have height percentile for weight. We have weight percentile for height or height percentile for age. So C is another piece of data. So notice that it's all pretty confusing, but this goes back to that idea that if we understand what information we have, A, B, and C are pretty quick eliminations. So that brings us to D, which says his weight is approximately 150% of his weight at age two. So that means that his weight at age five, which we're asked about, is 150% of his weight at age two, so we just have to find both of those pieces of information. So let's start by figuring out what his height is, because we know that he is at the 50th percentile height at two years old and five years old. So we look at that table that is height percentile in terms of age, and then at two, we find that on the left, and then we slide over until we see the 50th percentile. And we see that he would have been 87.1 centimeters of two. We do the same thing at five, find five on the left all the way at the bottom, slide over until we see the 50th percentile. And at five, he's gonna be 110 centimeters, which we actually had from the previous question. So now that we have the height, let's go to the bar graph so that we can get the weight percentiles in terms of height. So we know that he's at the 50th weight percentile. So looking at that bar graph, we know that the 50th percentile is the yellow line. That's the one in the middle. So now we're gonna slide over on the x-axis until we find 87.1, and then we're gonna go up until we hit the yellow line and determine what the weight is. And we see that the weight, the 50th percentile weight at 87 centimeters, that's gonna be 12 kilograms about. And then we'll do the same thing for a height of 110 centimeters. Find 110 on the x-axis, move up until you hit the yellow line, which is the 50th percentile, and that's gonna to translate to about 18 kilograms. And so now we wanna know what percent is the weight at five of the weight at two so pretty simple math here, 18 over 12, which is one and six twelfths, or one and a half, which is 150%. And even though that math isn't terribly complicated, you're down to D and E. Clearly 18 over 12 is not two or 200%. So at that point, the answer has to be D. And so that's it. Finished our first set of three questions. And notice here, not a lot of complicated math. It was really just being very diligent, knowing where information was located, and then finding that information. And these sources probably felt somewhat conventional and familiar to you. You've seen tables before, you've seen bar graphs before. So now I wanna do a second set of questions with new sources and just be prepared. This one's weird. Uh, and so if you look at it and your reaction is, what on earth am I looking at? This is insane. Rest assured, that was exactly my reaction too. And I've been doing this for about two decades. So we're gonna bring up the next set of questions. Again, the sources are going to show up first without the question. We want you to look at those first. Uh, after about a minute, we're gonna layer in the question. Note that some of the text is going to vanish when we insert the question because we just wouldn't have enough room otherwise but we summarize the key pieces of information so you're still going to have everything you need to answer the question so we'll put some time on the clock uh, and then we'll take a look at what is a very unconventional multi-source reasoning set of questions see you guys soon
All right. Let's talk about this second set of prompts before we dive into those questions. It's pretty brutal, right? It's a lot of information, a lot of complexity. And I've been doing this for an awfully long time. I've never seen anything even remotely like this. And so if your initial reaction was to panic or seize up or to think, yeah, I don't even know where to begin, you're in good company. And the interesting thing about this question is that it requires no outside information, right? Like you spent all of these months studying and suddenly none of those things appear to be relevant to this question. And it's so often that we get students who come to us and say something like, I, I don't understand it. Like I know all of the formulas, I can solve all the questions when I'm not under pressure, but then in the test, I, I just, I can't do it. And the feeling that this question induces kind of encapsulates what our philosophy and strategy is all about. Because right now you're at a fork in the road and one fork might lead to just kind of panicking and seizing up and maybe you're scribbling really fast. You're just kind of staring at it and going, what am I supposed to do with all of this? And the other fork involves getting your emotions under control and just getting the information organized so you can think about it clearly. Now you can get a bird's eye view and think strategically. And so this is the important move at this point. We wanna make sure that we're not panicking, we're getting our information organized. Now, if you're prone to test taking anxiety, and I certainly am, you probably want some kind of tool to cope with that anxiety in the moment. For me, it's a quick counting breath that I learned from a meditation app. So if I saw something like this and I freaked out, I'd probably inhale to the count of four, hold to the count of four, exhale to the count of eight. That seems to do the trick for me. If that makes sense to you, give it a try. If not, we've got a whole series on dealing with test taking anxiety. Feel free to check that out. But you want something that will allow you to recalibrate. All right, once we've recalibrated, now we'll move on to the prompts. So the discussion prompt is relatively straightforward, right? It's just capturing that idea that the supervisors have to be right next to the employees that they're supervising. Okay, pretty straightforward. And then maybe you take a look at the office plan. I've got a crude version of that on the board here. And that also seems pretty straightforward. Maybe the big thing to absorb is that you've got your cubicles A through D and A and B are only adjacent to 121, and C and D are adjacent only to 120. But otherwise, okay, pretty straightforward. So it's really that table that has the relationships of supervisor to employee, where we wanna spend a little more time and get ourselves nice and organized before we attempt the question. So let's do that. So I'm looking at that table, and I'm starting with the supervisor column just because there's fewer people there. So it seems like a more logical place to start. And the first person I see is Siren. So I'm gonna put a C on the board. And I see that Siren is supervising two people. So Siren is supervising Selena. And Siren is supervising Alana, right? If I keep going down, I see Siren's name show up a second time. So the next person who shows up in the supervisor column is Kim. And I'll do a quick scan to make sure Kim doesn't show up a second time. She doesn't. And so Kim's pretty straightforward. She is just watching Richard. So Kim supervise Richard. Next person I see is Leela. And note that Leela shows up a second time. She shows up again all the way at the bottom. And what's interesting is that the second person she's supervising is Siren. So now we have this additional layer of complexity where Siren is a supervisor and he's also being supervised. So Leela has to watch Siren and then she's also watching Pablo. So we'll capture that there. All right, make our way down. The last name we see, the last new name we see is Jamal. Jamal shows up twice because he's watching Atticus in May. So we'll put that over here on the right. So Jamal is watching Atticus in May. So notice that what we just did here 
it's nothing all that intricate, right? We're just kind of summarizing that information, but now it's in a useful form. So I can kind of take a quick look at that organizational chart and then think about, well, where can I actually place people within the office plan? And this is the key thing to do before you attempt the questions. And just be aware that psychologically, it's actually hard to do that. When you've got adrenaline coursing through your system and you're anxious because a question has freaked you out, your instinct, if you're like 99% of the people we see, is going to be, let me get right to the question. And this is one where if you go right to the question, you're probably in big trouble. But if you get that nice clean organization, watch how much simpler and straightforward the questions become. So now that we're organized, let's look at question four. So it says, based on the information provided, how many employees are there, each of whom could be assigned to Office 112? All right, so Office 112 is down here. And what's interesting here is that 111 and 112 are kind of on an island, right? They're not adjacent to anything else. So we're going to do a little quick trial and error, but you can pretty quickly see that this branch of five, there's no way to get them into 111 and 112 because there's just two offices, right? If we put Sirin in 112, well, we could only put one of the two people he has to supervise in 111, so he can't go there. It's gonna be the same thing for Leela, right? If we put Leela here, she's gotta supervise two people. That's not gonna work. So no one in this whole tree can be in this 111, 112 pair of offices. It's gonna be the exact same thing for Jamal, right? Jamal has to watch two people. If we try to put Jamal in 112, well, then he can only be next to one person in 111. So the only people who could be in 112 and 111 are Kim and Richard. So we could have Kim in 112 and Richard in 111, or we could flip them, have Richard in 112 and Kim in 111. So the answer to question four is B, there's just two. And notice that with this organization, that little bit of trial and error we have to do is really manageable and it can feel pretty systematic. But without that, it's very easy to just get overwhelmed at what seems like a lot of scenarios you have to absorb. Okay, question four, the answer is B. Let's do another question. And for this one, I'm actually only gonna give you 30 seconds to work on it. Because if we have this set up, those 30 seconds should be about 28 seconds more than you need. All right, I'm gonna step away and I'll see you guys in 30 seconds. All right, uh, hopefully you guys had more time than you needed for question five, which says, all right, for each of pair of employees, select yes if the two employees can be in offices 111 and 112, and if they can't, select no. Well, we kind of figured that out already based on the previous question, right? So the first pair was Kim and Richard, and like, yeah, obviously we can put them there. So that first one is a yes, we already established that. So Kim and Richard is a yes. And then Jamal and Atticus, well, no, we already know that's not gonna work, right? Put Jamal here, put Atticus here, but Jamal still has to be next to May and that's gonna be impossible. All right, so Jamal and Atticus, that's a quick no. And then last we have May and Siren. Well, that's obviously not gonna work. Right? If we put May and Siren here, Siren can't watch either of the people that he's supposed to be adjacent to. So that's not gonna work. And we already knew that from the previous question that Kim and Richard are the only two who could be in the pair of offices 111 and 112 because every other organizational tree is just too complicated. There's too many people to squeeze into two offices. So question five is a quick yes, no, no. All right, and at this point, there's just one more question. This one is gonna to be tougher than the other two, but for a question set of this difficulty, if you get two out of three right and you've managed your time relatively well, 
This is an enormous win. So for this one, we'll put the standard couple of minutes on the clock, uh, let you guys work through it, uh, and then we'll talk it through together. So see you guys in a couple of minutes. All right, so let's take a look at question six now. So this one says, for each of the following situations, you're gonna select yes, if based on the information and the workspace rules provided, it would prevent some employees from being assigned. And so we hit yes, if it's gonna prevent everyone from being able to place in an office according to the rules, and we would click no if it wouldn't prevent it, right? So you wanna make sure that you wrap your head around that language first. So essentially we're looking for scenarios that would mess things up. Yes, if it prevents everyone from being situated. And the first scenario we evaluate says, may Pablo and Selena need offices? So let's just start by designating them. So we know may Pablo and Selena all need offices. So now there's really no getting around having to do some trial and error here, right? Like it's just sort of like, there's almost no way to just look at this and just say like, yes, that would prevent people from being situated or no, it definitely wouldn't. So we kind of get our, have to get our hands a little bit dirty here and just sort of try and see. It wouldn't be unreasonable if you were to say, you know what? It's already hard enough to sit these people, three more people needing offices. I'm pretty confident that's gonna mess things up and click yes and guess. Not unreasonable on a question like this, but if we're gonna do it, let's do a little trial and error and see what happens. So the place where I might start, I might start with this group of five just because it's the most complicated because all five have to be adjacent to each other. So maybe I'll start by putting Sear in in Office 120. All right, so now I know Siren has to watch Selena and Alana. And so Selena needs an office in this situation. So maybe we'll put her here and then we'll put Alana in Office 119, or rather Cubicle 119D. Now we keep moving through. There we go. All right, well, Siren has to watch Selena and Elena, and Leela has to watch Siren, put her there, and then she's got to watch Pablo. All right, so far we're okay. And now is when we're gonna hit trouble. We could put Kim and Richard here, but then we can't situate Jamal with his two people, right? Remember if Jamal is there, he can only watch one. If Jamal is here, he can only watch one. So essentially we're hitting a dead end. And again, there's no way to really see that without just kind of diving in. But once we try a scenario, maybe you try a second one just to be safe. You'll see there's no way that we can honor that first condition and not mess things up. So the answer to that first statement is going to be a yes. This is going to prevent everyone from being properly situated. And again, we have to do trial and error here. So that's the first one. Now, when you move on to evaluate the second statement, you kind of have to make a quick decision about, am I just gonna cross these guys out 
or am I going to redraw this office plan? It only takes about 10 seconds to redraw the office plan. So it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Just note that you're going to have to dive in again because there's just going to be more trial and error on a question like this. So now let's take a look at statement two, which says two additional employees are hired and will be supervised by Jamal. So let's actually get that scenario on the board. Two more employees are hired and are watched by Jamal. So let's call these two additional employees X and Y. And then we'll see if we can get everyone into the office plan according to the rules. Now, I'm pretty suspicious about whether this is going to work. So if I'm pressed for time, I might assume that, yeah, this is gonna mess things up and prevent people from being situated, but let's actually see what happens. So we'll start with Jamal and his four people. So maybe we'll try putting Jamal in office 120, and then we'll stick the four people he's supervising around him. So we can put X and Y in 121 and 117, and we'll put Atticus and May in cubicles 119C and D. So we're able to get Jamal and the four people he's supervising in, but now we're gonna run into some trouble. Right, if we move over here to that tree of five people, you're gonna quickly see there's no way we can get them in, right? Like you don't have five offices or cubicles that are all connected at this point. And so you might go a little bit further. You might say, all right, I could put Siren here and Siren's gotta watch Selena and Alana. But now we've got a problem because Leela needs to watch Siren and there's no place for her to go. And essentially you're gonna see no matter what you do, you're gonna hit a roadblock. You're gonna hit that dead end. So statement two, that's gonna be another yes. Yes, this is going to prevent everyone from being situated properly. Okay, that brings us to statement three. And statement three says, Richard resigns. All right, this is by far the easiest of the bunch to evaluate. If Richard resigns, who cares? That's not going to make anything more difficult. It just means that Kim is gonna have no one to watch. So Kim might be lonely, but it's not gonna prevent anyone from being situated in an office or cubicle. So subtracting a person is not gonna make life more difficult here. So that last one is a no, this is not going to prevent anyone from being situated. And so your answers on this last question are yes, yes, no. And I have to reiterate, this is by far the hardest question of the bunch. And if you just guessed on this one and got it wrong and got two out of three right, you've won. That's a great outcome on a set of questions this difficult. And it's just to sort of take away that what makes some of these questions so difficult is that sometimes there's no avoiding some level of trial and error. And you just wanna be as organized and systematic as you possibly can be. All right, that's about it for this video. So again, the biggest takeaways are when you see these more difficult multi-source reasoning questions, you always wanna get a lay of the land first, read closely, reread as necessary, stay organized and stay flexible. Don't go directly to the questions. Get that bird's eye view first. Uh, if you guys have any sort of comments or questions, please feel free to leave them below. Uh, and we've been seeing all of your comments and questions on our other videos, uh, and they've been great. You guys are asking great questions that other people have. You've caught us in some goofs. You've given generous feedback. So we see it. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for watching. I hope you found it helpful.